Yeah, I'd say in general, Americans have like a real uh, like skepticism and like mistrust of doctors. It, it, they kind of, it's like auto mechanics is kind of how they view them <laughs> kind of. is like, yeah, you say I need a new muffler, but you don't need a new muffler. <laughs> like, my family was never in denial. No. I don't think. What's that like, Lauren? Tell me about yeah, exactly. a family that's not in denial. <laughs> not I mean, fantastic. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. My and Bialik's breakdown is supported by One Finance. Jonathan, repeat after me. I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. I'm a Canadian, so I don't get so mad, but I am <laughs> displeased. <laughs> what are we so mad about? Well, I just learned that banks are charging Americans $34 billion a year on overdraft payments. $34 billion. Jonathan, even though you're Canadian, you can understand that's a lot of money. It's $160 for every adult American. Jonathan, you and I both have experience of banks taking advantage of us. And also they do it in ways that you don't even know it's happening. Like if you're going to take advantage of me, tell me and then I can decide. Nope. They just sneak it. It's very sneaky and it's wrong. Do you want to get even? Switch to one. Enjoy no fee overdraft protection, no minimums, no membership fees, unheard of 3% APY on direct deposits. One actually cares about their customers and their service is so much better than traditional banks. You'll also get a $25 bonus when you use your one card. For full details, visit onefinance.com slash break. That's onefinance.com slash break. One believes in rewarding customers, not gouging them. Hi, I'm Ryan Bialik and welcome to my breakdown. These are the... <laughs> These are the people. <laughs> I'm not stoned. Off camera before we started, I said, I could be stoned. I wish I was stoned all day. You don't want to start the episode like that? I think it's a it's an ear The catcher. reason that I mentioned it. We are going to be talking to Seth Rogen and Lauren Miller Rogen about Hilarity for Charity, which is this incredible organization that they founded. Lauren's mother had Alzheimer's that presented very early when Lauren and Seth had just started dating and she was in her 20s. And like, long story short, they have this incredible organization that raises millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they do it with some benefits that are hilarious and there's comedians and they do all sorts of fundraising. But this organization also does a lot of education, outreach and, and funding research. But one of the things that we're going to talk to them about, and Lauren especially is going to speak to in particular, is a, a lot of what relates to mental wellness, mental illness. When you think about what one person in a family struggles with or has as their challenges, what Lauren is so focused in on and what they founded this organization to also do is to look at kind of the health of the whole family and what are the things that can be done to continue to support families who have a, a loved one, in this case, with Alzheimer's. Um, but a lot of the things that Lauren talks about make me very, very angry, but also they're very smart. But we'll first, let me introduce you to my favorite super bad but for <laughs> or my favorite neighbor or my favorite long shot. <laughs> Or my favorite American pickle, but I'd be the Canadian pickle, and I'm just going off of movie titles here because I didn't get my intro. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name. Jonathan Cohen. Uh, my, my favorite Seth Rogen fan. <laughs> That's really what he is. Jonathan, Seth's a, a fellow Canuck. It's true. Not the Vancouver Canucks. I didn't know him. Which it, You don't all know each other in Canada? Especially not the West Side. I don't He's know that. He's a West Side. Uh, Seth Rogen is from Vancouver. I actually didn't know that until- Didn't even we wave our flag for him. We, we did should've. not wave our flag. I do want to briefly mention a little bit about Alzheimer's. It's not called old timers, and I'd like no one to call it old timers. Some people legitimately think- but That's its name. That it's, that's its name. Um, it, it's actually senile dementia. And it is a progressive disease. Jonathan, what's progressive? It gets worse. That's right. It gets worse over time. And it destroys memory is what a lot of people know about Alzheimer's. Um, but it also impacts other mental functions. And um, What's the difference between that and dementia? Well, it, it dementia is a component of Alzheimer's. And as I said, this is senile dementia. Dementia can present when you're 20 for reasons that are not Alzheimer's, and then it's just dementia. Alzheimer's is a particular kind of dementia that comes because of 
particular uh, plaques and tangles and, and things in the brain that literally make information not able to get where it needs to get. And the reason it impacts memory is because there are certain parts of the brain that are impacted differentially. Alzheimer's is one of those things we really diagnose post-mortem because it's a very specific brain scan. But generally speaking, um, the, the medical world has started to have a, a pretty clear idea of a set of symptoms and distinguishing them from Alzheimer's versus, let's say, Parkinson's. Uh, Parkinson's disease has um, more motor function challenges, usually a specific gait, a way people walk, and a what we call a Parkinsonian mask, a disruption of affect because it's a different region of the brain. But anyway. I'm just going to include here that yes. if you just cannot get enough brain science, check out the Gary Small episode because we do another deep dive into aging in the brain. Aging in the brain, correct. And the main symptoms of Alzheimer's, uh, memory loss, confusion. You know, if you've ever, it, you know, you see it a lot on like TV shows you know, where people like, wander out of the house and it's usually older people um you know they wander out of the house and don't know where they are and don't know how they got there and um my grandfather had that yeah he was in toronto and he kept trying to walk back to montreal to deal with a wow. work work issue and that's how we knew uh things started but it to was go not a job that he currently held uh, he had retired for 30 years oh wow yeah so would he get out of the house? Yeah, he would get out of the house. He would get lost. He would then start, a, he was like, he was a notary when he was working oh. and he was like trying to deal with a deal that like, a big deal that was- In his mind he was dealing with. Well, what I find interesting is like, it felt like he had the unresolved issues, emotional issues mm. of his life then sort of resurfaced. And I've always wondered, mm -hmm. you know, what is the play between sort of the big emotional stressors in our life that don't get resolved and do they sort of come back around if we start to have these types of neurological uh, conditions? For him, there definitely was some there. He was always looking for his mother. He was always looking for this business partner that had a deal had gone wrong and wow. he like, had all these unresolved uh, issues that he was trying to sort out. Well, and, and oftentimes with Alzheimer's, some of the cognitive, you know, upset, you know, people will often experience agitation. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of managing of, of those symptoms. And people, especially in the earlier stages, will sometimes come in and out of awareness, which is yeah. very, very painful. And I, I know this sounds like a weird thing to say, but there's been a lot of really, really beautiful movies um, made, you know, by artists and creators who have experienced this or, uh, you know, have chosen to tell these stories and can be really, really heartbreaking, especially with couples. And, and as Lauren's going to explain to us, you know, also being a, a younger woman, you know, her mother was quite young when, when her symptoms um, started presenting. Let's welcome Lauren Miller Rogan and Seth Rogan to our breakdown. Break it down. Welcome Lauren and Seth to our breakdown. Thank you. We're going to ask the, the question I've only asked Matthew McConaughey when he came on. Do you guys have any idea who we are? Of course. <laughs> oh, are you kidding? <laughs> oh my God. Just check we it. Very much. Very, so. very much so to, to the point that I won't go into detail and make yeah. you uncomfortable. <laughs> exactly. No, the goal is to make her as uncomfortable as possible. Well, Ma Matthew McConaughey literally said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nice of him to come promote well, his book. Well, and that's, that's what we book, said. That's why his book did so well. Is he was doing. He was <laughs> saying yes to podcasts. Was, people he didn't even because know because of our little <laughs> podcast. Um, it's very nice to get to to talk to both of you, um, Seth. We've we've crossed paths in some uh, Jewishy ways because that happens in Los Angeles. I think we've been on a podcast together before. What podcast were we? <laughs> were we on Sharon Browse's podcast? No, it wasn't. Oh, a podcast. that was just a conversation. Was that just a thing, oh, or it was that, a talk? It was it, like a talk or no, something. No, it like was. That. It was. I think it was Purim. Was it like yeah, several? Yeah, yeah. Well, oh. We did Purim like a crazy Purim Zoom. There was yeah. a game. It was a thing. Anyway, that's what it was. It was for like a charity event or something like that. Yes, maybe. that's right. Yeah. It looked like this, though. It, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, a screen and some squares. And exactly. The um, and Lauren, I've actually been really intrigued by you, not just because of all the neat professional things you do, and I just directed my first film and wrote oh, cool. it as well, and so um, very just excited that you exist. But also the work that both of you do together um, is interesting to me both as a scientist and kind of to both me and Jonathan, since our focus here is kind of like mental health as like an umbrella, but also more specifically kind of looking at the ripples of what happens in families when things happen. Um, and I think that's yeah. that's been kind of a recurring theme for us that everyone we speak to, you know, 
either has some trauma with a capital T or a lowercase t or <laughs> something that happened, you know, in their childhood that was formative. Many of our actors, you know, have this sense of like being separate. We, we get a lot of, you know, former addicts here, <laughs> just the full gamut. <laughs> um, but I, I, I would like to talk to you a little bit about a couple aspects of, of the work that you do. Um, so your your life, Lauren, was touched specifically by Alzheimer's. Your your mother had early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So can you just kind of frame it a little bit for us so we can understand? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it actually started before my mom. Uh, her parents, my, my grandfather had Alzheimer's. My grandmother had you know, dementia that was caused by the doctors, you know, always back and forth between Alzheimer's and Parkinson's mm -hmm. and just uh, whatever it was, because this was the 90s and diagnoses were even harder to come by then than they are now. So, um, and so then when I was in my early 20s, my mom, you know, when she started repeating herself, it was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, this is... Yeah, this is this is going to be the reality here. Are we allowed to joke all the time? Because Jonathan's going to be like, Maya repeats herself all the time. Does she have Alzheimer's? <laughs> <laughs> There's a specific way. You know what I mean? Like, yes. like um, I, I always I always say I've heard this expression that's like, um, it's it's very normal to forget where you parked. It's not normal to forget that you drove to the mall in the first place. Mm. You know, yeah. so like. It's human to forget. Like it's Lisa – actually, Lisa Genova who wrote Still Alice actually wrote a great book that is mm. about the the benefits of, of forgetting. So mm. anyway, sidebar <laughs> there. But um, but yes, my mom was diagnosed when I was in my early 20s and she was in her early 50s. And by the time she was just about 55, uh, she was diagnosed – and I'm, I'll say it in quotes. Uh, but, um, you know, because even back then it was – uh, unclear and well, and and even still, I should say Alzheimer's is one of those diagnoses that typically can be made post mortem because yeah. there's a very specific a very specific pattern that you see that you you can't tech. So we're we're basically judging by symptoms when we're looking right. at people and trying to like fit in what category they go in. Exactly, which you know is 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 not easy and doesn't make any sort of you know makes it impossible essentially for any sort of treatment or prevention, which is you know uh, where things were back then. Um, and so you know it was really tough, and we were just starting to date Seth and I, and so it really truly like we had been dating like two or three months, and my parents came out to L.A. and met him for the first time, and like when I dropped them off at the airport, I came back. Um, to his apartment and it was the first time I had like said it out loud to anyone that I mm. was like worried and like the first time I like cried about it and like you know and then from there you know it just progressively got worse and by the time she was you know just about 60 she couldn't you know feed herself or mm. dress for herself or care for herself in any way and really wasn't communicative at all and you know and and was you know completely different version of herself and and, you know, it really was an, an uh, unbelievable uh, just journey for my family and, and for myself, um, you know, to experience that and to watch my mother go through that at that point in my life. You know, I, I just wasn't <laughs> – I thought I was alone and I was just like not prepared as most people in their 20s would be. Um, and so, you know, we eventually started – talking about we, we went to a walk like an alzheimer's association walk and they were like what is seth rogan doing here and so then we you know we were like this people is ask that a lot, lot. What he is doesn't seem charitable <laughs> <laughs> well you know yeah. and we were young we were, we, were, young. we were young and so um and so anyway so once we started sharing our story it was like oh we're so not alone and unfortunately there are a lot of young people who are dealing with this with their parents um and so yeah so we decided to you know throw an event and hmm. you know then through that event it was like oh what are we going to do with our money i really want to take action and eventually you know founded our own 501c3 and now have like five incredible people who work for hfc and we've raised i think close to 17 million dollars and help people and yada 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 well no time. and i i, I <laughs> no and i appreciate i know that you have to not have to but i know that you're in a situation where you have to kind of like describe it like that a lot mm -hmm. My Alex Breakdown is supported by Helix. I've had my Helix for, gosh, I think, did I get it during COVID? No, I got mine, now I can't remember. It's been years of good sleep. I have found the mattress that I want to have forever. Helix Sleep has this quiz that I took and it takes two minutes to complete. It matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Jonathan, which one do I have? 
You have the midnight. Right, because I like firm, and I sleep every way. Front, side, back, upside down, on my head, all the ways. It's a huge upgrade from what I used to have. I also loved, it just comes to your house, you open the thing, you roll it out, it's ready to sleep on. Go to helixsleep.com slash breakdown, take the two-minute quiz, you'll get a customized mattress. We think it'll give you the best sleep of your life. Helix Sleep is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows to our listeners at helixsleep.com slash breakdown. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize, but something that Jonathan and I talk about a lot, a lot of physical symptoms, headaches, teeth grinding, digestive issues, those can be indicators of stress. Also, let's not forget about doom scrolling. I call it going far down the rabbit hole. Sleeping too little, sleeping too much, undereating, overeating. For me, stress is a constant. I think it has been my entire life. And it shows up in all kinds of ways. In a world that tells us to do more, sleep less, and grind at work all the time, we're here to remind you to take care of yourself. And maybe it's time to try therapy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy. They have video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. You don't want to see someone on camera? You're not ready to? That's fine. It's more affordable than therapy in person. You can be matched with someone in under 48 hours. Try it. See if online therapy can help you and help you manage your stress. Our podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and My and Alex Breakdown listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash break. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash break. You know, we think so much, like, especially with these kinds of neurodegenerative things. Like, we think a lot about, like, what's the treatment? And, like, you know, how do we make them comfortable? And, like, how do we this? But, you know, what what you experienced, and I think what, what Hilarity for Charity has kind of done, is it's expanded the conversation out to say, like, what's the structure behind the person that has the thing, right? Right. So, um, you know, that's, and, and this is not, I don't want people to think it's like an, you know, an advertisement for Hilarity for Charity, but. It could this be. Is, but, it could but why be. not? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, because it's, it's also, you know, it's kind of this like three prong sort of mission, right? There's this like, mm -hmm. there's the care component because there's things that are actually practically needed, especially for people who don't have resources. Um, but also to broaden like an understanding of the importance of a support system around that. And, and then also like the research that then gets funded because you, you raise a tremendous amount of money and that literally is what funds the research that is yeah. needed to move along, you know, and like we talk about cures, but it's also a lot about kind of treatment and quality of life and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I did want to sort of ask about in terms of like the, the structure of a family when, when my father, um, a blessed memory was in hospice, it was the first time that I was in a situation where I realized, Oh, there are people who know more than we do, <laughs> who have more information and more ability to actually help. And their it was like crazy that that was their job yeah. to like help us. And of course they were paid, you know, but I think that's something that, you know, that you really highlight and maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Like you should not have to tackle this no matter what your socioeconomic background, where you live, like you should not have to tackle this kind of thing as a family without yeah. education and, and help. Like, can you speak yeah. a little bit to that component? I feel like I'll start with a story, which is early on in my mom's uh, journey through all this. Shortly after her diagnosis, I was visiting her. They were still living in Florida, uh, which is where I grew up. And, um, I remember we, I had a conversation with her, which was asking her if she was, I asked her if she was scared and she mm. said she wasn't scared for herself. She was scared for me and my brother and my dad. Mm. And that was because she had taken care of her parents and she knew what lied ahead wow. for us. And so, you know, our family always had an indication, but of course we didn't really know until we were really in it. And my mom's journey was actually quite different from my grandparents. Um, how much care is needed to take care of someone with this disease. I mean, my mom was a technically, physically, completely healthy 60-year-old woman mm -hmm. when she couldn't walk anymore and care of herself at all. And so that is a level of care, a level of expertise that is beyond, you know, my loving father's, you know, capabilities. And so we had to call in help. Mm. And luckily we could, which is right. not normal. That is, I mean, it is 
the cost for care is extreme. It's, it, I mean, it's cost prohibitive. Like that's it's literally. Impossible. It's literally like for, you know, for most people, it is ridiculous. And so that's why, you know, when we started raising money, it was like, well, how can we help people? Like, I want to help people today. Like, I'm not going to raise $2 billion a year to fund the research that's going to create the medication that's going to treat Alzheimer's. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, sure, I would. If you want to give me the money, I'll figure it out. But like, you know, what we raise is something tangible that could really help people today, which is how we had the idea to create our grant program to award people literal care, like people who have, you know, chosen to have their loved ones at home and can afford respite, have no break, have no chance to go to the grocery store or go to the doctor or like sometimes literally we've gotten thank you notes because someone went to a funeral because they received one of our care grants. Mm. Like, and these are just like basic things that people can't do when they're caring for someone with Alzheimer's. And so, you know, we really wanted to focus on like helping people today as much as we could on one side of it. And then of course there's, you know, brain health and we can get to that on the other side, which is mm -hmm. sort of for tomorrow. But, you know, what people deal with Every day when caring for someone with Alzheimer's is so extreme and there is, you know, they need so much help and so much guidance. So, so we really try to focus on that. Well, oh, sorry, what am I about to say almost sounds, is, well, I think it sounds really trivial because Lauren, your experience, you're dealing with this firsthand, but Seth, you're in a new relationship with someone who's like having a pretty life-changing experience that has ripple effects on you too. You're like, oh, I'm a young person. I'm <laughs> like, life just gets really real all of a sudden. What was that like for you to have her going through that? It was, I don't, I, don't, I, 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 I implored her to seek professional help <laughs> because I was, very quickly saw I was uh, not capable of um, providing any uh, valid guidance beyond <laughs> love and emotional support but um as far as like the tools one needs to deal with like something uh, truly devastating like i you know i'm like a pretty coddled jewish boy from vancouver canada of all places so like you want to talk about secure in their lifestyle it's a canadian I think also what Jonathan was asking is something that is very specific, I think in particular to early onset to this situation of like, we think, you know, like as humans that like in our 20s, we're still invincible, right? I mean, and you know, some of us, it goes on even longer than that. But I think that's something that I experienced. And you know, my, my father passed at 73, which, um, you know, is considered quote young. He had multi-system atrophy, which is um, kind of like ALS, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, but I was the first person like that I knew that had a parent yeah. that was going through something like this neurodegenerative. And right. I remember that notion of feeling like this extra kind of like self-consciousness about like yeah. burdening, like, you know, like I didn't want anyone to catch to catch my my grief, right? I want them to right. catch my, and also when you have a, you know, as Lauren, you understand, you know, um, very very well. When you have something that's also like progressive, because I I was dating someone at that time. It's like, it's like kind of uncomfortable, and like you want to show like I'm cool with it, but also I'm yeah. sort of falling apart. And so I guess that was part of I think what Jonathan was getting at also, like in our 20s, both for you, Lauren, and also like as forming a couple, it's like, wow, this is something that I wasn't planning on dealing with. And it does bring up like, when you're thinking about having kids and like all this stuff, like Lord knows the genetic load I gave my kids. And I was like, do I give this to someone? Just the meanest that is me. Um, so I think that's part of, you know, kind of what what Jonathan was asking. And also, People from Canada have a whole different perspective about healthcare because their country is very different. So I'm also wondering, Seth, like, did you have any experience with this kind of thing, you know, that felt different from the way, let's say, you were dealing with it watching Lauren? Yeah, I'd say in general, Canadian, like, Americans have, like, a real, uh, like, skepticism towards and, 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 like, mistrust of doctors, um, in a way, they kind of, they kind of, it's like auto mechanics is kind of how they view them kind of is like, yeah, you say I need a new muffler, but do I need a new muffler? <laughs> like, you know, uh, and in Canada, that's, we don't really, that's not really a thing. Like, cause no one would be incentivized really to trick us into getting a new muffler, you know? And so, um, I, I think it, it, it is weird. Um, but, uh, I don't think. It wasn't that big. I think ultimately, 
And I think like, you know, in COVID times, nothing proves this more. Like when the shit hits the fan, people go to the doctor, <laughs> you know, um, as, as skeptical as you may be about something, when you're actually sick, a doctor, you know, you welcome a, a medical expert. So um, yeah, they, they went to doctors, um, which was nice. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, my, yeah, there was, my family was never in denial. No, I don't think like, you know, what's that like, my, Lauren, tell me about yeah, a family yeah. that's not in denial. <laughs> It's not I mean, fantastic. It's, yeah. you know, <laughs> it is I mean, I would say, you know, my, my dad wasn't like, you know, my brother and I arrived at it sooner, I think, because we weren't with my mom as much. And I always say it's like, you know, when you don't see a baby for like two months, you're like, oh, it's so big. Oh, my God. And that's how it was. You know, I'd see my mom every few months and I'd be like, oh, God, it's gotten this much worse. Hmm. Whereas my dad was with her every day. So he didn't really notice it. So there was a little bit like. I think there's something. No, 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 it's fine. I think there's something. No, yeah. no, no. I think there's something. Yeah, there's yeah, there's something. And so luckily there wasn't that to deal with. Yeah. But yeah, and, and Seth's family also like his his mom and his sister, you know, are social workers. So they're very like that's so handy. It really so like literally like so when, so like literally he's like not joking when he was like I'm not equipped for this. You should go see a therapist. Like you know what I mean? Like to to get that suggestion from a 25 year old dude like is did you know, he recommend pretty... that you call his mother <laughs> right That's, yeah like you know and so um never uh, <laughs> was uh and anyway she'll call so <laughs> you don't have to call you her don't, she'll you don't call. have to call <laughs> there's an incoming call <laughs> A lot of people look at things like Alzheimer's, you know, Parkinson's, like you hear these things, you know, kind of like floating about. And many people are generally dismissive of mm -hmm. this kind of conversation because, like, well, everybody's going to get something. And like, oh, we used to just call it getting old. And it's like, well, people didn't used to live past 50. So a lot of the things that also we're dealing with is because we are living longer. And, right. um, you know, we had, what was his name? Sorry, I shouldn't say that. Dr. Gary D Smalls. Well, Gary no. Small, no, David oh, Sinclair. David Sinclair. You know, there yeah. are people who are like, we can live forever. Like, we'll fix everything and you'll live forever. But like, I'm a little bit more of like a, not so much. But um, what what is, even besides the early onset, like what is sort of, I'm not asking this to be a jerk. What is the point of educating people? Meaning what can we gain by having this kind of information so that we're understanding things, let's say, earlier or better than we used to? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when, when this first started, things felt pretty hopeless and bleak, I would say. Like, you know, I would say I would search the corners of the internet and there was nothing but a lot of sad stories out there. Um, and eventually, however, I found other things other than sad stories like hope and science that was proving to, uh, you know, provide some hope and light in the area of brain health. And so um, I first met uh, Dr. Richard Isaacson, who uh, was formerly at the Wheel Cornell uh, Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic in New York. Um, and, you know, and he was the first person that really like, he, he took a deep dive into my genetics, into my mom's genetics, mm -hmm. into my brother's genetics, um, into my uncle's genetics. And that's because early onset is a very small subset of Alzheimer's well, and it is actually, so special. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. So actually, my mom technically did not have early onset. Wow. So she had Alzheimer's that had an onset that was early. Got it. And, okay. and, and we don't know exactly why, but there are hypotheses, which is – had she perhaps not had a hysterectomy at oh, wow. 47 years old in 1996, mm -hmm. given what she was given at that time, perhaps she would have still gotten Alzheimer's, but it would have happened in her late 60s or early 70s. Can we just like do a full stop right there? Wow. We can. We can do, we can absolutely I mean, do that's, that. that. That's enormously like f fascinating, terrifying, and also, gosh, how do you wrap your head around that? Lots of people are asking why right now. Yeah. Like, oh. why, why would that impact? Uh, well, I, I don't want to get deep up into Lauren's business, but I'm going to make a general I'm going to make a general uh, statement that there are many things that turn on certain genes and there are um, many hormones that are acting as messengers in the nervous system. And a lot of things in particular, forgive me, that are done 
to women and have been done to women for hundreds and hundreds of years under the guises of good Western medicine um, ha have a lot of impact that were often not fully researched. So one of the things that has come under a lot of scrutiny is the administration of hormones, which we start giving girls very, very young in the form of birth very control young. pills, you know. Um, anyway, not to get too political, but <laughs> that's fascinating also because yeah. you want to trust the system and right. to be t to the, oh my God, what ifs have to be enormous. Yeah. Absolutely. And so once, you know, I started learning about that stuff, started seeing that my mom and my uncle were pretty similar genetically, hmm. but his Alzheimer's didn't happen until his late 60s. He's since passed away as well. Um, you really look at those factors and it becomes pretty clear. And so early onset Alzheimer's is sort of uh, sort of reserved for some of the genes like the PSEN1. Right, and, and they're very they're specific for early onset. Yeah. yeah. And that's and that's a very aggressive form that is mm -hmm. uh, I can't speak that scientifically to it, but but because that is not what my mom had. My MB Alex breakdown is supported by Rothy's. Jonathan, doesn't it feel amazing when you find a perfect new obsession? Like when you met me? No? Like that new show you can't stop binging or a new restaurant you've ordered from three times in a week? Rothy's might be your new shoe obsession. You may have heard of Rothy's The Flat Shoes or The Point. I've got those. Well, I've got all of them. But The Point is something that People Magazine named the best flat for their first ever style awards in 2021. They also make insanely comfortable sneakers, loafers, ankle boots, and more. I have these really cute um, booties in mustard that are super, super crumpy and awesome. The best part is everything Rothy's makes is better for the planet. They've repurposed millions of water bottles into the signature thread that goes into every one of their products. Step up your shoes and accessories this spring. Get ready to be asked, are those Rothy's? Which I ask people all the time. Please, Listen to us. Rothy's is the way to go. Get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash breakdown. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash breakdown. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Nutrafol. 30 million women are impacted by weakened or thinning hair, and I am among them. If you're among them, you're not alone. There is a solution that so many women trust to deliver results. There are two targeted formulas for women that are clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness through all stages of life. But healthier hair growth takes time. You experience thicker, stronger, faster growing hair in three to six months. And in a clinical study, after six months, 86% of women reported improved hair growth. I hear so many hairstylists talking about Nutrafol, not because of what we do, Jonathan, but it really does work. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com. Enter the promo code BREAK. Save $15 off your first month subscription. It's their best offer anywhere. It's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time and free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com. That's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com. Promo code BREAK. My mom had two copies of the APOE4 gene which is a, you know, a gene that is an indicator. Um, and so basically, but in learning that and learning my own genetic makeup, you know, I was able to say, okay, so I'm made up of this, this, and that. Hmm. Smart doctors and people have been able to say, so since you're made up of this, this, and that, take this, this, and that, uh, do this, this, and that, live a lifestyle that includes this, this, and that, hmm. and your brain health will be, your, your outlook will be better. And so, you know, I have implemented these lifestyle changes over the last, I guess, five years or so at this point. And my overall health has, I mean, changed dramatically. Okay. I have to, I have to ask. So this is like yeah. our second full stop because, yeah. you know, even as a scientist person, like a lot of times you hear like, oh, eat blueberries or like, you know, and my right. mom's always like sending me these lists and I'm like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, whatever, because I'm very, I'm very like genetically deterministic. I'm like, it's yeah. in there. The second my mom and dad did the dance, like everything was said. And it's true. We want to also be, we're invincible, right? We want to drink. Right. We want to smoke. We want to like party. We do all the things that we do. Like I try all the drugs. I'm not saying I did, but some people do. And we want to believe that. Yeah. Okay. So Seth feels like he covered that. Um, no, but we want to feel like I just get to like eat fast food when I want and I want to eat pizza and I want to drink beer and I want to like live my life. So I'm going to go ahead and ask, what are these things? Right. I mean, look, I would like to do all those things, but 
but sure. you can't. And so, you know, I think there's a statement that I've heard that I think is really smart, which is something along the lines of your genes may be the roadmap. They don't have to be the destination. Right. And so, you know, so basically there's lifestyle changes. So like the, the most important one, of course, is sleep. And so, you know, I wear a sleep tracker. Um, HFC uh, has a partnership with Whoop. Um, you can get get a Whoop and it tracks your sleep. It also tracks your exercise. Um, but since tracking my sleep, I have done things to improve my sleep. I'm super into what she's saying right now. This is so <laughs> crazy because he's obsessed with sleep just because. Oh, but she gets so annoyed when so I annoyed. send her the screenshot of so my annoyed. Aura of Ring your sleep. sleep. Lauren loves her sleep. Oh, I mean, I can't sure. wait. Well, to look the at my two of you should morning. talk, and Seth and I can go have a beer. <laughs> it's, I love a score. She loves a sleep score. I would be like, oh, I didn't sleep well last night. Here's oh, the data God. to back it up. And she'll be like, that doesn't mean anything. You're so obsessed. Okay, wait. It does so mean sleep. something. Okay, it so, does. So sleep. Sleeping sleep is good. Is, sleep is the most important thing because at, when you're sleeping at night, as, as you know, these smart doctors would say, is when your brain is taking out the trash. So like when you're, you're not sleeping, your brain is building up uh, plaques and proteins. Yeah. And literally when you're sleeping, when you're deep sleeping, especially. I can't. It, so wait, wait. So what what disrupts sleep, Lauren? Oh, God. Well, I mean. Well, for me, alcohol. I will wake alcohol, up every freaking food. hour. A hundred. I can have one glass of wine and that sleep score. Bad. Oh, okay, so bad alcohol. News. What else is bad for it? Eating late. Can Eating be late. Oh. You want to have a consistent bedtime. Oh, you shut wanna- up, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I love how she's like upset with you, but we've had like seriously <laughs> reputable medical experts. Not that you're not reputable. Tell her the same thing. She will she's, ignore them entirely. She's not done telling me what I'm doing wrong. But you're talking to her and it's landing. It's okay, all landing Honestly, for the most her. consistent bedtime. One of the most important things that that I did that first really increased it was I got a, a pad that cools my bed. Oh, oh yeah. Jesus. Um, a pad that cools your bed? You can't yeah. sleep hot. Yeah. Yeah. A cool very, room is very important. A cool important. room is so important. Yes. And especially like as a lady, like, and I'm not even that old, but like I'm, you know, I'm already sweating like crazy, but now I don't. <laughs> Okay, you know, who's the sweatiest I, person I know? I, I'm the sweatiest person all of you know. Okay, so so sleep. Okay, so that's number one. So sleep, so sleep one. I would say the second is exercise, mm-hmm. um, which is you have to move your body. You know, you you want to and and I'm, and look, having muscle is is legitimately really important. Thank you. Is that realistic for everyone? Maybe not. But literally walking, making sure you're getting, I think it's like at least three days a week of like 60 minutes of like a zone two cardio. So like a good hike, a healthy walk, like those things are hugely important. But having muscle on your body really, really helps. Um, and then there's diet, which is so painful because God, I love food. Um, you know, sugar. No sugar. It's such a bummer. Sugar's the bad thing. I mean, it's, it's such a awesome. And sugar's so good. And I still have sugar. I, I you know, I, I try <laughs> not to have it frequently. It's, you know, a treat, you know, on occasion, but like sugar's the the hard one. But but you know, diet is important. It's it's I don't know if it's about eating blueberries all the time. Not that that would be bad for you. I think it's more about a, a sort of larger approach to, you know, eating cleaner, more mindful. Mm-hmm. Etc. I'm taking yeah. notes. Um, I'm literally taking notes. Go ahead. Good. <laughs> I mean, you can also you you can also go to our website. Yeah. Oh, I will. Um, <laughs> okay, but so so sleep, exercise, eating, and anything else? Those are the big three. Here she comes. Yeah, and then and then there's mental fitness. I knew which she is, was going to freaking say which that. Which is you know like keeping your brain active, like learning a new thing, okay. learning, you know, a new hobby, language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wait, is is included in mental so me- mental fitness? You're speaking specifically about like exercise literally for your brain. Is there anything in here about like mindfulness or like meditation yes, or like sorry, spirituality? That is, the, sorry, that is the last one. Thank oh, you. Okay. Yes. You're and the, so then there's mental well-being, mental okay, fitness and when, mental well-being. So yes, exactly. So, you know, whether it's meditation, which of course is excellent for your brain health, but also overall health. Yep. Um, you know, and then of course, you know, maintaining a healthy emotional well-being. Stress is really bad for your brain. And, you know, and I, you know, it's, it's hard you know, I think like all of us these days are living in a place where we're constantly just like, oh God, it is. Lauren just, she just, she signed my death warrant is what she <laughs> just said. Like, you sleep too hot. I sleep. You okay, don't meditate I, I'm gonna, here, this is like, she gave you me the do's and late. don'ts. I, I, I don't, okay, I did cut out alcohol. I, 
I eat too. I I cut myself off at 10 p.m. What Michael, time did you guys stop eating? They stop eating at 3 p.m. No, <laughs> 8 p.m. We tried. Okay, I could I could work towards eight. What? Did, <laughs> what? He's so mad. What? Go I, ahead. I we had we had a conversation not that long ago. She's like. Now you you don't want to eat dinner past seven o'clock. I'm just like I don't want to order dinner at nine. That's, that's not healthy. Right? <laughs> Which we did for a long Which time. We, yeah, yeah, we, we, we it, were. Uh, it's hard. But it impacts your sleep. Yeah. Okay. I do. I do exercise. You do exercise. Yep. I do yeah. taekwondo. It, the eating thing is the is uh, you could, is a habit that is uh, I would say if you can exercise then eating earlier isn't that hard. Yeah, we do the we do the intermittent fasting thing where we you know. But okay, fish. here's he, I mean, not that you have to solve all my problems, but maybe a couple. <laughs> I'm here. Sometimes for you. I work until eight thirty or nine at night, and right. we don't get a dinner break. Like I get like a couple right. vegan chicken fingers, which I'm trying to cut out. I'm vegan. They I'm trying to cut out soy, and like that's almost always the thing. You'd think I was the star of the yeah. show and the executive producer. You wouldn't know it from the food that happens in my life. <laughs> No, it's hard on set. It, and on set is hard. Yes. Yeah, and like uh, we so have if, doctors who come and like talk to us all the time about how like especially people in the film business have it's a rough. Well, and also like the, you know this is this is also a little bit champagne problems, which I know you I, I know your organization does address this, but the fact is, you know, for for many many pe for most of the world, you know, these things are. I I extremely difficult to access without the proper government like support funding which right. is also I know a lot of the advocacy you do mental fitness I think I'm pretty good I speak languages already you speak mental languages well you play I music she signed my death warrant with stress well the stress is out of control I have different genes that she doesn't have yeah, yeah. <laughs> stress is a tough one stress is a tough one yeah. I mean you know I think Seth and I started the beginning of this year meditating together we're pretty good at it we've the last little bit we've gone, we've, we've taken a few breaks, but we were, we were really good. And we'll get back into it. It's hard though. <laughs> it is hard. It's hard. Like, look, it's hard. It's just hard to be a person out there. Okay. I'm going to ask something that is like a little bit related to something we were going to see if you like us enough to talk about. <laughs> um, and I'm not asking this like in an inflammatory or um, sensationalistic way, but let's talk about, I think we should talk about pot. <laughs> because I think especially over COVID, a lot more, I mean, I've heard a lot more people drinking, a lot more people, you know, using different methods of, you know, THC and, and potness. Um, this is a great example, at least to me, of something that like, different than alcohol, right? Different mm -hmm. than alcohol. And in many ways is extremely relaxing, right? Yeah. It's like an amazing plant. Um, but also can contribute to a lot of other challenges to a life if it impedes, let's say, a, an ability, you know, to to function effectively or to eat well. I mean, it's like the munchies is like a re it's a real chemical thing, right, that happens. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, not just about pot, but like about things kind of on that spectrum. There's this balance, right, of like the things we want and need to try and make us less stressed, you know, but there's a little bit of a trade-off and I feel like you're a couple to ask about that because obviously, you know, Seth, you know, is known as being someone who talks about this a lot. And I'm, I'm curious about that. Well, Lauren can speak to this as well, I would say, but um, we, uh, yeah, we both smoke a lot of weed. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I think uh, like anything in life, different people find different ways to navigate it. You know, um, I think there are some people that uh, maybe they it it affects their motivation or mm -hmm. uh, desire or ability to do things. Do I know a lot of lazy people who do nothing that don't <laughs> smoke weed? Yes. <laughs> um, so I would not necessary would those people be lazy without weed maybe right uh, it's not a it's not a scientific study i've seen done necessarily mm -hmm. you know um we could do uh, it we're happy to be your subject yeah please let's do it <laughs> um i think that uh yeah i think as far as like munchies and things like that go like i think it is habitual like you can easily work you know, knock it out of your system it's like me and my uh, writing partner evan talk about a lot as well is like we just kind of don't do that anymore we don't we like, don't um, like i think you know i think that for for us yeah. weed is something that is 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 so consistent that it's not like we're like let's get really baked and then <laughs> eat a bunch of chicken wings like yeah, right. that's not we're not doing that and mm -hmm. so you know the 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 diet of it all i would say for us is not you know affected you know with weed but you know scientifically we have talked 
to doctors about this. No doctor is going to be like, smoke weed. That's sure. Up. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. But no one's strongly saying Jonathan don't could find weed. us a couple doctors who tell you. And, <laughs> well, I mean, the, 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 the yeah, brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, brain people, but yeah. they will say that it's better than alcohol. No, it's better than alcohol and, and that it and, potentially has anti-inflammatory effects and that it for sure relaxes people and takes stress away. Right. So, like, I'd say, again, yeah, no one is... No one's saying that the negative effects way outweigh the positive ones right. for us personally. Right. And I think a lot of people would probably fall into that category as well. But um, I'd say it is like anything like, you know, some people, you know, uh, wear glasses and some people don't. So mm -hmm. I think like uh, not everyone needs the same things to get through the day, right. you know? Um, and, and uh, so, yeah, I think, um, but I, I, it is encouraging. I think, I think there is, a way for almost everyone to incorporate some sort of uh, weed derivative into their life, be it CBD or something to help them sleep or relax at the mm -hmm. end of the day, things that have no psychoactive effects. I mean, I think that there's a lot of very positive effects uh, and, and uh, offerings that uh, weed has. So it's nice that it would be great if it was federally legal in America. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yes. And I'm, I'm actually curious, um, anything that you can share? Um, I don't mean anecdotally, although if you'd like to, you yeah. can um, about weed and sleep, because also you, you bring up mm. sleep and that is one of the places that um, a lot of people do, you know, essentially instead of popping and I don't know, I don't take sleep drugs, so I don't know. And Ambien, yeah. Or, or whatever. Um, yeah. th this is something that that more people, you know, oh, yeah. um, are, it's are much using. better than those things. But right. things are not. Yeah, you right. don't get quality sleep when you've taken. Like our doctor was like, if you've taken an Ambien, it's equivalent to someone like punching you in the face. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like go that's night night. Sleep. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's like you would never conflate an unconscious person and an asleep person necessarily. <laughs> right. you know? They must and be I, having a really good yeah. rest. Um, and so I think like that. Uh, yeah, I think that's what sleep drugs offer is they essentially knock you unconscious. Um, no, uh, but weed doesn't do that. And so I think weed um, is probably a great thing for a lot of people who are having trouble sleeping, especially um, an incredibly healthier alternative to things like Ambien and pharmaceuticals. Well, and, and the other thing, and this is, again, just kind of like something anecdotal that I'm talking about. <laughs> no one needs to know why I'm bringing this up. Um, but a lot of people who have trouble sleeping because specifically of trauma, um, of night terrors, find, you know, a very different kind of sleep. So I'm also one, like part of me, like, again, as the scientist brain starts working, I'm like, part of me is like, well, they're getting rest. They're not being woken up, right, by terrible. But then the other part of me is like, but there's some processing that's also being kind of bypassed, you know, that... I also hope it changes the you know. REM sleep that right. that we get. Yeah, so in I'm, some ways, I'm curious if I haven't spoken to experts about this specifically, but I've this you know, is seen the, the study Whoop needs to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. no, it's it's it is interesting because I've had doctors. You know, part of one of like you know the neurological workups is like how are your dreams? But like, and I have crazy dreams, hmm. but I've always had crazy dreams. I've always been you know the kid who was like, tell let me tell you about my crazy dream, right? And like you know and you know, remembers them and it yeah, that's actually what's more interesting because everyone yeah. has dreams. Yeah. Everyone has crazy dreams. The, yeah. the interesting thing is not necessarily that you, ha it's that you remember, that's the the part of your brain that I'm most interested about. But also yeah. anecdotally, there's a lot of people who, who are smoke weed a lot who don't remember their dreams or claim to sort of not dream. And it's usually yeah. when they try to taper off that their dreams become sort of right. like wildly active. So it's interesting that You've always had really active dreams. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it changed it at all. No, and I've never like, had very active dreams and continue to not have very. Yeah, active dreams. I'm always like, "How do you not know your dreams? What happens to you at night? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you go? Nothing." I was looking at Seth, your um, funny Twitter, is funny, like tragically funny. Twitter feud where you did mention Tourette syndrome. Is this something oh, yeah. you talk about? It being in your family. Um, I, I talk a little, a little bit. I mean, like just like uh, that. It doesn't come up a lot. Yeah, I, I wrote a book. Well, you've never a, been spoken I, uh, to by a neuroscientist who has a yeah, podcast. Yeah, there you go. Uh, an I wrote a book that where I talk about it a little bit, mostly in regards to my dad, who it's it's much more noticeable um, in him. Uh, and I have uh, two half brothers, and um, 
I I don't know. I actually, I, I feel like maybe they ha- have some lingering feelings of it as well, you know. Sure. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, but yeah, it, it was it was worse when I was younger, and I'm sure it. Did you have vocal stuff or uh, motor stuff? No, never. It was more like uh, twitchy. Uh, Got it. Facial. Uh, yeah, I would twitch in different ways. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren. Can you demonstrate again? <laughs> Got it. <laughs> That just looks like contemplative. It's just consternated. If they haven't seen the trailer for um, for the 2022 trailer for your institution charity, I don't know exactly what to call <laughs> it. Charity. Yeah, institution. <laughs> organization. Organization is the word I'm looking for. These Canadians, they don't know what word to use. You throw amazing events, and, and you know the use of. You know, my, I saw my grandfather go through Alzheimer's and I was only 12 at the time and it was not a pretty situation. Um, but yeah, you have to, you have to use humor. And so just yeah. so appreciative of that. Um, people, you should tell people where to find that. Yeah. That do you want to give us kind of like the, uh, the website and all those good things? Our website where you can find all sorts of information is wearehfc.org. That links to a site where we actually have recently created educational coursework for high school students and cool. college students to learn about brain health. Um, and that's called HFC Universe. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, on all the social media stuff, I think it's We Are HFC. Yeah, We Are HFC. We Are HFC. Yeah. Hilarity for Charity is our events and HFC is our organization. Look at that. Some corporate structure, for God's sake! Um, Finally, <laughs> are you presenting the org structure next with the <laughs> yeah, reporting yeah, lines? Yeah. Like PowerPoint, please. We really appreciate you coming and talking to us, and and Lauren, I especially appreciate how much light you're shedding on again, kind of like the family structure surrounding these things. Um, because I think again, a lot of people think of these things as isolated. Or when I think of you know, my father was bipolar, and you know, I think a lot about like his experience, and and mm-hmm. wh- while that was part of the story, the rest of the story was everybody else you know and yeah. and all the things that go into that so um it's obviously a very important topic but also a really important aspect um of it to touch on that i think um people will relate to for a lot of different things i really appreciate you adjusting our dinner time <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> well we're yep. glad to help in all ways exactly early bird gets the worm <laughs> thank you thank you both so much really nice to talk it's to easier you easier to get a reservation at five <laughs> are you googling uh Cooling pads for my bed? Yeah. No. Freaking Lauren Rogan making me go to sleep early. I just think it's hilarious that, like, I, I wish I could have captured your reaction when I told you, like, the exact same things. About... I, you don't need to capture it. I'm happy to recount it right okay, now. Okay, re- let's do a little reenactment. Mime, you know, <laughs> a consistent bedtime. And... Oh, shut up, Jonathan. <laughs> no, I don't say that. You know, winding down. You know, for... <laughs> Winding down for bed, <laughs> not being on your screen as you fall asleep. Who's going to answer these emails, Jonathan? <laughs> at 12 o'clock at night. I don't email at I wonder when they night. go to sleep. Don't you wonder if they like wind right, down for right bed? Right now, I think right after this. <laughs> they, if you can't eat, there's no point in being awake. <laughs> Once like, the eating stops, it's right much, to bed. Pretty much. That's the only thing that stops me from wanting to eat is going to sleep. It's like last bite of cake, brush your teeth, fall asleep while I mean, I'd say answering eat, your last I'd, email. I'd say eat it in bed, but she'd tell me I can't do that either. How are you going to brush your teeth? <laughs> I don't need to brush my teeth. She didn't say it's I got to do it to prevent Alzheimer's. She did not say brush your teeth. Mouth health is actually very Shut tied up. to your brain. Jesus. You don't want that plaque. You got to get rid of the plaque. It's, for, it's your heart, not your brain. That's what I threaten my children with. That you're going to you have know, a heart attack. You're gonna, I don't say you're going <laughs> to that. Sorry. That may be your parenting technique. Hey, Fred, as a 13-year-old, you're going to have a massive coronary if you don't brush I mean, your teeth. so intense, though. Like, also, just to think of what, you know, she was dealing with. And I understand, you know, there's a clinical difference between early, early onset Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's that presents early and all the complexities there. But, uh, you know, I'm 46. Like... 50s right around the corner and you want to go for a walk no no but it's just um you know we're mortals the larger takeaway here is that there is a playbook for general health 
we have own your we have owners manuals for this thing that we carry around that we live in and most of us are absolutely clueless and are I'm under just... the delusion that we can do whatever we want and there's a medical system that we can take a pill to fix us and the reality is is that we are very complex creatures that the things that we do like sleeping in a too hot room and like tossing and turning People are like, oh, that's just sort of normal. Here, here's, okay. I remember the first time you told me that your feet were hot. <laughs> I was like, your feet are what? And you're like, my feet are hot. Or Okay, one second, one second. I tell have a tell them about I have the a point. time. I have a point okay. and I'd like to, go ahead. Tell them about the time you wore your shoes on the wrong feet. <laughs> And the reason I bring that up is because you criticized me for being aware that my feet were hot, and yet I did ever said to you, okay. wow, what type of lack of physical awareness. This might be a two-parter episode. <laughs> you know why? Hot Maslow, you're That's right, I am up pulling up <laughs> Maslow. Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. The reason I bring up Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that the most basic thing that is kind of our, our first order is phys the physiological needs we have. So these are breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep. Okay. So that's your basics. So, uh, yes. And if you have food- Oh, I'm sorry. Are you Dr. Maslow? Shouldn't you know that consuming it late can have an impact on you? I'll get there. It's higher up on the hierarchy of needs because- if you think of those physiological needs, next is safety and security. That's employment, property, family. The next level up is love and belonging. That's right, folks. Love, yes, love is love and love conquers all, but also it it is not the most basic need that we have. Next up is self-esteem. Uh, you know, confidence, um, being a unique person, <laughs> which I say like that. The highest part, is self-actualization, which is things like creativity, acceptance, um, you know, uh, here, experience, purpose, like what even is that? Meaning and inner potential. And a lot of things that, forgive me, wealthy Western white people talk about do, do tend to, to hang in this top part of the pyramid that I would consider, it's not that it's not important, but here's here's the story. The, the things that I'm talking about are- I still are, haven't made my point. The things How that many I'm, minutes can we go without me actually making my point? The things that we're talking about, a lot of them are in the bottom two. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jonathan. When I was a child, Jonathan, <laughs> when I was a child, did I know what kind of bed I had? Did I get to choose what kind of bed I had? Hold, I'm not done. I'm not done telling you my sad story. Did I know what kind of mattress was most comfortable? Did I know to even think about, are my sheets soft? No. That's not what we're talking about, though. But you, you could have had the same dinner that you had <laughs> that night. At every Any night that you had a dinner that you were growing up, you could have had it an hour earlier. Okay, Jonathan, <laughs> we're not talking... <laughs> I'm talking about many people are raised in an environment yes, where- I'm, a, I'm in agreement and, with you. And, and you're also right that the notion of being, aware, like it makes me sad. The notion of being aware that your feet can be hot is, and you are, you are a person very in touch with your body and you have trained to be that, per like you've worked very hard at that. It's, it's something that you have cultivated. But for, for many people, that awareness, there is no time or space for that awareness. So uh, this is not to undermine at all. I mean, if if anything, it's to highlight the work that Lauren and Seth are doing in that everyone deserves to know what are the basics of our health. Yes, absolutely. How we optimize that is is very different. And I'm just saying we do need to be careful with the conversation around that. I agree. There's many things powerful about also people like Lauren, you know, who take this kind of experience and and truly transform it into a way to help people have access to things that she acknowledges she was very lucky, you know, to have. I, I couldn't help but think about, you know, even when my father was in hospice, like, what do people do who don't have hospice? You know, and my, my parents, I grew up in Kaiser, you know, Kaiser Healthcare. I don't know if that exists every everywhere. Um, but my dad was a public school teacher and our insurance was Kaiser. It was, you know, and it was in, it, kind of an institutionalized corporate, you know, system. Um, 
but hospice, you know, was one of the things that was, you know, but we, it wasn't enough. I mean, we ended up paying out of pocket for someone to, I mean, sh my mother couldn't pick him up off the floor every time he fell. So like, what do people do? You know, like they, 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 they do the best they can. Well, this is with all medical yes, conditions. Absolutely. You know, my brother had his accident. We were in Canada. We had a lot of um, support through the Canadian system. And even that, we had to go well outside of that in order to get him help and support. Because, uh, and my mother stopped working and right. changed her entire career to be a, to care for him. And I mean, people are, we don't have a system of support to help families through caring for people who are well, and especially, going through that. Well, and I think especially, this is something I forgot to ask them, but I'm sure they don't want to get back on the phone with us. But uh, one of the things is that also like the way that we treat old age, you know, in, in Western, really in Western society, I, I mean, I don't want to say like exclusively, but for sure in, in this society, I shouldn't say Western society, in this society, um, and it could be North America, you know, it's very much like put them in, a, put them over there. You know, it's like you're going to, and I think growing up in L.A., it was very much like you don't want to get the disease of old. You don't want to get the disease of wrinkle. Yeah. You don't want to get the disease of gray, uh, of stretch mark. Um, you know, so many of us don't. But if you come from a traditional family um, or you come from a family where it is culturally or, or religiously, you know, even uh, part of the structure to to take care of of elderly people, you also get all of that wisdom. I mean, you know, a lot of the studies about kind of reports of happiness uh, and people living well into their 80s, 90s um, as thriving people. There's a great documentary, Happy. Um, it shows that where older people are listened to, where older people are heard, where There's they are given value, exactly, there is a role for them. Anyway, so that's also part of this conversation when you talk about things like Alzheimer's and even early onset, which like, you know, 50s and, and you know, beyond as it were. Um, but there's a real fear. There's a real fear of aging in our society. Um, and it really is, I mean, not to bring all of us down, it is a fear of death and dying, you know? And in in cultures or religious traditions that don't see, you know, death as the end, right? Death is not the end, is what some people say. There's less of a, a fear of being close to that, you know, and, and witnessing that. Uh, and indigenous people honored this for all of human history um, until, you know, the in invasion, as it were. <laughs> my positive take on, on this, my sort of summary here, and this goes with many experts that we've spoken to, is that no matter what situation you're in, there are very minor things. It can be taking another deep breath a day mm -hmm. to having a few minutes to just clear your head and walk around your block if it's safe to do so, that can impact your stress level, reduce your stress level, and just- And help you sleep also. And help you sleep, get off yeah. your phone a tiny bit earlier, change, if you can, the temperature of the room that you're sleeping in, or lighten your blanket, or have a consistent bedtime if it's possible and your work allows it. I think there are a lot of very small things that people can do, and we have some impact on how we- age and what our uh, physical experience is. And um, we need to know this. And that's the type of information that I think uh, needs to be democratized and that there are so many people out there still that don't understand that they can do small things that will change their health. Um, not to embarrass my mother. I mean, she's not here, but she can still be embarrassed in the universe. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, my, my mom grew up in a very specific um, situation. She grew up in a tenement house. And, um, you know, it was um, possibly a little bit of a glorified <laughs> tenement house by, by standards. But, um, you know, she grew up, she grew up in poverty. And, um, you know, I think a lot about the stories that she has told me about place, places that she would try and find peace because there really was none. Um, you know, she never had a room of her own. She didn't really have a space of her own. Um, her grandfather, who had tuberculosis, like active tuberculosis, lived in the apartment with them. So he kind of like took up, you know, the, the other space and they tried to sort of isolate him, you know, so that they wouldn't all be sick all the time. Um, but, you know, there were certain things that she would talk about, you know, that like the library, you know, mm -hmm. was a place for her because like, 
it was it was an open public space, you know, where she could dream, Just be. dream and be. And she said she would um, take like a like a shoebox or an empty box and like put little things like just to create peace, like just like a concept. And, you know, the fact is, you know, when you close your eyes, <laughs> that's what your imagination and your. So that's why, like, also having uh, organizations that foster that, you know, for young people, especially in um, in challenging situations is so important because it increases the ability to have access to these higher levels, you know, of needs. Um, anyway, I didn't mean to, like, make such a tangent, but, you know, Lauren and Seth, they, they bring up a lot of things that then, you know, stimulate other ideas about how it's true, how we treat families and how we, you know, how we care for people. If you want to tell us how you care for people, you can do so at Bialik Breakdown on Instagram. Send us a message. If you haven't already followed the show, subscribe anywhere you get podcasts and check out the YouTube channel. Click the little bell notification Ding. for new episodes. Um, I'm very, very grateful that they spoke to us. And um, yeah, that's it from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's my Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. Oh.